Chapter 1 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark J. Peterson, Louisville, Kentucky, MarkJPeterson.com. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy. George Washington. Way down in Virginia, near a small creek called Bridges Creek, there is a shaft of white stone. On it is the name of George Washington and the date of his birth, February 22, 1732. On this spot once stood the big brick house in which George Washington was born. It was built in 1657 by John Washington. His grandson, Augustine, was the father of the little boy who became our first president. The mother of George Washington was Mary Ball. So sweet and fair was she when she was a young girl that she was known as Sweet Molly. Now, she was not the first wife of Augustine Washington, and he had two boys, Lawrence and Augustine, when he made her his wife. These boys were so kind to their small brother George when he was young and gave him so much help all through his life that their names should stay in your minds. When George was three years old, his home was burned to the ground, and his father built a fine new house just over the river from where the city of Fredericksburg now stands. Here, George went to his first school, and the name of the man who taught him was so queer, it will not go out of your mind. It was Hobby. In those old days, the boys wrote to their boyfriends, just as they do at this day. See what George, when he was nine years old, wrote to his friend, Richard Henry Lee. Dear Dickie, I thank you very much for the pretty picture book you gave me. Sam asked me to show him the pictures, and I showed him all the pictures in it. And I read to him how the tame elephant took care of his master's little boy and put him on his back and would not let anybody touch his master's little son. I can read three or four pages sometimes without missing a word. Ma says I may go to see you and stay all day with you next week, if it be not rainy. She says I may ride my pony, Hero, if Uncle Ben will go with me and lead Hero. I have a little piece of poetry about the book you gave me, but I mustn't tell you who wrote the poetry. G.W.'s compliments to R.H.L and likes his book full well. Henceforth will count him as his friend, and hopes many happy days he may spend. Your good friend, George Washington. I'm going to get a whip top soon, and you may see and whip it. You see, the boys in those old days were fond of books and toys and horses, just as the boys of today are. And there is a tale of George and a young colt, which shows that he was a brave and strong boy who did not fear to tell the truth, though he had done wrong. He and some of his boyfriends were in a field in which were kept some young colts, some of which had been used. The boys caught one colt, put a bit in its mouth, and held it while George sprang on its back. The colt, mad with fear, sprang in the air, tore through the field, and tried in vain to throw the boy. At last he leaped with such force that he broke a blood vessel and fell to the ground dead. Just at this time, George's mother came out and saw the dead colt. She asked the boys if they knew how he died. Yes, madam, at once said her own boy. And then he told the whole truth. There are more tales of the boy life of George, and all show that he was a brave, strong boy, full of life and fun, and at the head in games and sports of all kinds. His father died when he was only 11 years old, but his mother lived to be an old, old lady who was, you may be sure, very proud of her great son. After his father's death, George made his home with his brother, Augustine, until he was 16 years old, and the short notes which he wrote to his mother were not like those he sent to his boyfriends, or like those which you boys and girls write today. He began, Honored Madam and ended the stiff little note, Your Dutiful Son. 
In those days, folks lived on great big farms or plantations, as they were called, and raised tobacco, which was sold for much money in England. George's father had a very large plantation and many slaves to work on it. Some day this would all belong to George, and so he was taught how to write in a big round hand, how to do sums, and how to look out for those who were in his care. All through these years there was talk of war, for a cruel war between the French and English known as King George's War had begun, and the boys who heard so much talk of war, of course, played at it. And George was ever at the head, ever leading these bands of young soldiers. He longed, just as boys would today, to throw away his books, to leave school, to go to the true war and bear a real gun. And when he was fifteen, his brother Lawrence, who was a soldier, tried to make his mother let him join the Navy, as he was too young to go to the war. But this mother was a very wise woman and said no, that his place was at home until he knew how to care for the great plantation and the many slaves that in five or six years would be his. Now at this time, this great land of ours was so wild that it was hard to tell how much land a man owned, just where one great farm ended and the next began. And a man who knew the land so well that he could tell folks just these things would be of much use. So George now began to give much time to just this work, and so well did he do it that soon folks came to him when they were in doubt. In fact, this work led, as you shall see, straight up to the president's seat. His brother Lawrence had married Anne Fairfax, and in their home at Mount Vernon, George met many great men. Among others was Lord Thomas Fairfax, who owned a piece of land so large that he did not know how big it was. He sent George to find this out, and now this young boy had a rough piece of real work to do. In March 1748, he and a young friend, George William Fairfax, left the ease of Mount Vernon to live in the wild woods, where they would see only Indians, or at the best, rough white men. In the log huts of the white men, they found so much dirt that after one trial, rather than sleep on dirty straw with no sheet and but one torn thin blanket, they either lay on the bare floor near the big wood fire, or else built a huge fire in the woods and lay close to it on the earth. They had to swim their horses over streams. They shot wild deer and birds, and often cooked and ate them, alone in the great wild woods, far from even the camp of the Indians. Once, at least, we know from a little book in which each night George wrote of what they had done that day, that they saw a grand war dance of the Indians. The music by which they dance was made by a pot half full of water with a deer skin over the top and a gourd filled with shot. This must have made queer music to dance by. The boys were gone six weeks and did their work so well that the governor heard of it and he made George a public surveyor. That is, it was his place to find out the size of all the new farms, and his word was to be law. He must have done this work well, too, for the lines which he laid down were the ones used by the new states years and years after his death. Now, for weeks at a time, he was alone in the woods with the Indians, living in their camps and learning of their life. They taught him many things, and they in turn learned to love and trust him, this lonely life made him a grave and quiet man, one who talked little, and it taught him to think for himself, at an age when most boys are told what to do by their parents and friends. When he was not in the woods, hard at work, he was at Mount Vernon, and here the talk was of the great lands in the West, and of the war between the English and the French, who were each trying to drive away the other, and were both trying to force out the Indians. It was pretty hard for the Indians, who now had not only to fight each other, but the white men too. At last they took sides, some with the English, some with the French, and a fierce war broke out over the land near the Ohio River. No white men had yet lived there, and both sides wished to own it. The French moved very fast and built great forts and sent men there to keep the English away. It was no play war in which Washington now took part. He had real men under him. But, just as he began to learn what real war was, 
he had to go to the West Indies with his brother Lawrence, who was very sick. They spent the winter there, but Lawrence did not get well, and came back to Mount Vernon in the spring, where he died in July 1752. He left his land in charge of Washington, who now made his home there, and when his brother's daughter died, he became the owner. Now, while Washington had been away, the French had been very active. They had made friends with the Indians and had even dared to send some English traders in a ship to France. At this act, England was up and in arms and sent over great ships and many men to help fight the French. The first step that England took was to send men to warn the French away from the English forts in Pennsylvania. And Washington, who knew better than anyone else the rough wild woods, and who was a friend of the Indians, led a little band of seven men through the dense dark woods and over rivers filled with floating ice up to the French lines. He told the chief man of the French troops just what the English said. But this French man would not give up one inch of ground that he had won from the Indians, and gave Washington a note to take back with him in which he said as much. Of course, England could take but one course now. And so the long, fierce war, known as the Seven Years' War, began. Washington was made a colonel, and showed so much skill, and was so brave, that in a short time he took charge of part of the troops of General Braddock. In June 1755, the troops made a start for Fort Duquesne, where they were to stay. And on this trip, while they were deep in the woods, the Indians, with fierce shrieks and wild cries, sprang on them from the rocks and trees. The horse on which Washington rode was shot. General Braddock got such a wound that he died, and many poor men were killed. Here again, Washington acted so bravely and was so wise that the soldiers said that Braddock had lost the day, and Washington had saved the army. At Braddock's death, Washington was made chief of all the troops in the colonies, and the first thing he did was to place men near the homes which the white men were making in the new lands, and so help these early settlers to stop the Indians when they came to rob them and burn up their little log cabins, for a great fear of the red men was over all the land. Now, when the war came to a close, with the fall of the French, we find that Washington is a very great man, that his troops love him very much, and that the heads of the states feel that he is a strong, wise man, and one whom they can trust. All this time you know that he was an English soldier, fighting for England, but deep in his heart, and in the hearts of all the brave men who fought with him, there was, we may be sure, a love for this fair land, and a longing for its best good. After the war was at an end, Washington, who was very glad to give up his post, married Mrs. Eustace, a young widow with two little children, a girl of six years and a boy of twelve, and went to Mount Vernon to live. For twenty years now he lived the quiet life he loved so well. He took good care of his farm, was happy with his family and friends, and grew day by day in power. He did not lead an idle life, you may be sure. He rose early, had his breakfast at seven in summer and eight in winter, then rode over his farm and saw that all was right. He had his dinner at two o'clock, then had an early tea, and often was in bed by nine o'clock. Twice a year he sent to London for things needed in the way of dress for his family and slaves, for tools, books, drugs, etc., some of the things he bought for the children, I think you boys and girls would like too. He sent for tops, little books for children to read, a doll, and other toys. Washington loved horses and was very fond of hunting. The name of his pet horse was Blueskin. He must have looked very fine when he was on horseback, for he was a big man with bright blue eyes and high color, and he wore a red vest with gold lace on it and a dark blue cloth coat. Mrs. Washington rode in a fine carriage drawn by four horses, and her driver wore the Washington colors of red, white, and gold. These old days were full of life and fun, but there was work as well, and soon came more talk of war. All through these twenty years, this land was growing bigger and bigger, 
and at last came the time when folks did not see why they should not be free from England and rule their own land in their own way. At last, England made a law called the Stamp Act, which put so high a tax on goods that folks here would not pay it. Tea was one of the things on which this tax was put. And when England sent over three ships full of tea to Boston, our men would not let it be taken from the ships, but broke the great chest and threw all the tea in the water. The act is known as the Boston Tea Party, and now the first signs of war were seen. A fierce fight took place at Lexington one Sunday morning between the British and American troops, and now all over the land went up the cry, To arms! To arms! This is how the Great War of Independence began, and you know the name of the man who was at once put at the head of the American army. George Washington, of course. Now, he was not an Englishman fighting for his king, but an American fighting to free his own land. A long, hard fight it was, too, but not once did Washington or his brave men lose heart. He drove the British out of Boston, and then, for fear they would go to New York, he sent men there. But the British ships went to Canada instead and made that land theirs. It was just at this time that Richard Henry Lee, the boyfriend of Washington, made a move in Congress that our land should say to the whole world that it would be free from British rule. And so the Declaration of Independence was drawn up and sent out to the world on July 4, 1776. War now began in deadly earnest. And at the great battle of Long Island, our men met with great loss of life and had to flee from the foe. Soon after this bad news, the British took Philadelphia, and now Washington was sad at heart. On Christmas Day of 1776, though, our troops won in the great fight that took place at Trenton, and there was joy in the whole land. Good news came with the New Year, too, for Washington won many fights, and at last, in October 1777, the British troops in charge of General Burgoyne gave up their arms to General Gates. That winter of 1777 was a bad one for Washington and his men. At no time in the war did they suffer so much. The time was spent at Valley Forge, and the men lived in log huts which they had first built, in long straight lines, like city streets. Twelve men lived in each hut, and there was a fireplace at the back, but no fire could keep out the awful cold, and no hut was snug enough to keep out the snow that fell in great drifts around this little town of log huts. To make things worse, there was little food to be had. The men had only poor, thin clothes, and their bare feet often left marks of blood on the white snow. But the men did not lose hope and kept their faith through all the long months in their great leader, whose lot was quite as hard as theirs was. The farmhouse in which he had a room still stands, and it is hard to believe as you look at this old house on the banks of the Delaware River that once the big orchard back of it and all the pretty fields were filled with poor little wooden huts in which, for the sake of freedom, lived and suffered thousands of brave men. In the spring, things were better, for France joined America in her fight for freedom, and three years from this time, the British were beaten at Yorktown, and America was free. One of the great Frenchmen, who gave us much help, and was a firm friend of Washington's, was the Marquis de Lafayette. A very sad thing during these last years of the war was the base act of Benedict Arnold, who made up his mind to sell to the British some post near West Point, of which he had charge. He sent a note to Clinton by a young British spy, Major Andre, but on his way to the British lines, this young man was caught by three of our men. They found the note in his boots, and he was brought to the American camp, tried for his life, and hung as a spy. Benedict Arnold had made his way to a ship and set sail for England, and his name is hated not only by his own land, but by even the land to whom he tried to sell his country. It was in March 1783 that the news of peace spread through the land, and it is said that Washington wept with joy as he read the glad news to his troops. 
He gave orders that the whole army should give thanks to God. And this was done at a great meeting on the day after Lord Cornwallis laid down his sword. Then there was a great ball given at Fredericksburg, and Washington's old mother, 74 years old, was there leaning on the arm of her son. And do you not think she was proud? As one after another of the great French officers bowed to her and spoke in her son's praise. It was on Christmas Eve that Washington came home to Mount Vernon after eight years of war, riding in state with his wife at his side. This great American, feared now by kings and loved more than ever by the country he had made free, came gladly back to take up the quiet country life he loved so well. And here, could he have had his way, he would have lived until his death. But this new country needed at its head a man whom folks loved and trusted, and of whom other lands stood in fear. No man but Washington could fill this great place. And so at the end of three years, once more at his country's call, he left his home. This time to become the first president of the United States. Not one voice was against him. Every man in the new country voted to give him this last honor. And on April 30th, 1789, in New York City, he took the oath of office. Washington, who was a very rich man, had taken no money for serving his country in the war and said he would take none now. But because other presidents might not be rich enough or good enough to want to do the same, the people made him take $25,000 a year. Now you know the presidents get $50,000 a year. Washington was in New York, but one year, then the capital was moved to Philadelphia. And here he lived, in great state, until after eight years in the president's chair, once more and for the last time, he came back home to Mount Vernon. At the end of his term of office, Washington only waited to see the next president, John Adams, take the chair, and soon after he came back, talk arose of war with France. And of course, the country turned to him. He was again put in charge of the army, and took up the public life he had so gladly laid down. But he had not long to bear it this time, for on December 12, 1799, while riding in a hard rainstorm, he took a heavy cold from which he died on Saturday night, December 14th, between 10 and 12 o'clock. Washington was buried at Mount Vernon, and today the tomb of the father of his country, as he is lovingly called, is a sacred place, not only to us, but to the men and women of the old lands, which were taught by him so long ago, to honor and fear this great new America. Washington had been dead just 100 years on December 14, 1899, and the date was made much of in the United States, in New York City, in Washington, and at Mount Vernon. There was a great time in his honor, for this great man is as dear to his country today as he was when he was alive. End of chapter 1 Recording by Mark J. Peterson, Louisville, Kentucky, markjpeterson.com Chapter 2 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Peterson, Louisville, Kentucky, MarkJPeterson.com. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy. John Adams. John Adams was born not in the far south with many slaves to wait on him, but on a small farm in Braintree, Massachusetts. Here, from Old England, had come in 1636 his great-grandfather, Henry Adams, and in this old home was born on October 19, 1735, John Adams, who was to be the second president of the United States. Now, on this farm in the east, there was much work to be done, and few to do it. The folks who had made their homes here did not lead such lives of ease as those who lived on the great farms in the South. 
As a small boy, though, of course, he was taught to read and write. John Adams had a good deal of hard work to do. There was wood to chop and snow to be cleared away. There were horses and cows to care for. And there was much work to do in the fields. In all this work, John took his part, like the brave, strong boy that he was. When the days grew long and cold, he was sent to an old school near his home. And here at once he took his place with the boys, as one who would lead in the fun and sport of all kinds. There was a good deal of fun, too, in those days, for boys and girls both. In the cold days, there was good, strong ice on which to skate. There was snow to play in, and to make fine roads for long rides in a sleigh. And when the days were long and hot, there were fish in the big streams, and there was game in the wild woods. John was not fond of his books, but still he did good work at school, and when he was quite young, went to Harvard College. He left it in 1755, just at the start of the Seven Years' War, and the name of George Washington, the brave young colonel of Virginia, rang loud in his ears. He taught school in Worcester to earn the means to take up law, and in 1758 he became a lawyer. He had many cases and grew wise and great, though he did not make much money, as folks in the small town of Braintree were far from rich and paid small fees. But he did make many kind friends, and far and near he was known as a man of clear, strong mind and quick, bright thoughts. He had a fine, sweet voice, too, and his speeches were always wise and showed much thought. In the strife with England, he was, from the start, on the side of America. So much did England fear him in 1757, the English king sent word that he would give him great wealth if he would serve him at this time. Adams would not do this. He would speak and act just as he thought right, and be bound by no king. When the Stamp Act passed in 1764, he made a great speech, which was sent to those at the head of his state. And when, in 1770, a troop of British fired on a mob of American men and boys in the streets of Boston, he took the case to the courts and spoke for the British captain and his men, though they had killed five of our men. It may seem strange to you that Adams, who stood for American rights, should here take sides with the British. But first of all, he stood for law. And though he knew he ran the risk of losing his high place in the hearts of American men, still he would do what he thought right. But men love truth, and like to see a brave man act as he thinks right, and so felt that he had just the clear, cool head and brain and the strong, warm heart to give aid in the dark days that were to come to the land. He was sent to the first Congress and was one of the three men who drew up the Declaration of Independence. He was also one of the three men to go to France and ask for the aid which she gave to America in the spring after that hard winter at Valley Forge. Do you see why this trip at this time was a brave act and one by which Adams ran a great risk of losing his life? England had no wish that he should reach France and her ships tried in vain to get him. If he had been caught, he would have been hung as a man who was false to his land and his king. You know that he went to France, though, and did his work well. He stood up for our rights and had a bill passed which made the ports of France and England free to our goods. At the end of the war, he was sent to England to look out for our rights there, and though now this is a pleasant task, it was not then. For it was hard for Adams to be true to America, and yet not anger the English king, George III. But we have seen how bold and brave a man he was. So the first thing he said to the king was, I must tell your majesty that I love no country but my own. And said the king, An honest man will never love any other. In spite of this, Adams met with much rudeness at the English court. But he did his best for his country, and when he came home in 1787, after twelve years of hard work, he was met with great joy. He was made vice president with Washington, and at the end of Washington's term of office, he was made president. 
He served only four years and then made way for Thomas Jefferson. At the age of 68 years, with the love of the whole land, he went to his home in Quincy, Massachusetts. His heart was ever with his country, and he lived until his son John Quincy Adams was made President of the United States. His last thoughts were for his country. On June 30th, 1826, he gave as a toast for the great feast to be held on July 4th the words, Independence Forever. He died on the night of this, America's great day. His last words were of Jefferson. He said, Thomas Jefferson still lives. But this was not so, for Jefferson had died a few hours before on this same day, and this young land wept for two of her great men, both of whom, in giving up their best to their country, helped to make it the great free land that it is today. End of chapter 2. Recording by Mark J. Peterson, Louisville, Kentucky, at markjpeterson.com. Chapter 3 of Lives of the Presidents, Told in Words of One Syllable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Peterson, Louisville, Kentucky, markjpeterson.com. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy. Thomas Jefferson. When Thomas Jefferson was a boy, his home was so near the Indians' camp, and he saw so much of them, that I am sure all boys will like to read of him. His father, Peter Jefferson, took his bride, Jane Randolph, to a house in a wild tract of land of over 1,000 acres, way out in Virginia, right in the midst of great woods. He was a big, strong man, and this strength was very useful to him in making his new home, for he had to chop down huge trees and then cut them up into the logs of which the little log cabin was built. He took with him into this wild new land only a few slaves, but with their help his farm soon grew large, and he became a rich man. The Indians were great friends of his, and always sure of a warm welcome in his home. Still, the Indians were not always at peace with the white men, who had come to make their home so near them, and folks had to be on the watch for fear the red men would rob and kill them. Peter Jefferson was made colonel of the men who kept the Indians back in the woods and away from the little town that was fast growing up near his home. Now, this great strong man was fond of books, and it was with his father that little Thomas began to study. He was also taught to ride, to swim, and to shoot. And as he was fond of music, he spent long hours in learning to play on the violin, or fiddle as it was then called. The Indians near his home liked him, and he used to play tunes for the little brown Indian boys to dance by. He was only nine years old when he went to boarding school with a Mr. Douglas, and here he began to study Latin, Greek, and French. He was so near home that he did not stay away long at a time. And indeed, this home was such a happy one, so full of life and fun, that he did not want to be away from it long at one time. But this happy time did not last long, for Thomas was but fourteen years old when his brave father was shot in a fight with the Indians. This boy was now at the head of as big a place as the father of George Washington had left to him. And though he kept on with his books, he had the care of this great farm to think of and plan for. He was a bright, well-read boy, and was but sixteen when he took a place at William and Mary College. Here his love for books and music kept him from the wild life led by some of the young men there, and made friends for him among the great men whose homes were in Williamstown. He met a great lawyer, George Wythe, and began the study of law with him when, at the end of two years, he left college. In five years he began the practice of law in his old home in Virginia. In two years, so bright and quick was he, and of such a strong, clear mind, that he had 198 cases, held a high place in his state, 
and was a rich man. In 1770, while he and his mother were away from home, the old house burned down. When news of this came to Jefferson, his first thought was for his books. And he said to the slave who had told him, Did you save any of my books? No, master, said the slave, but we did save your fiddle. You see, even when he was a great and busy man, he still loved his fiddle. But the loss of all his law books was very hard for a busy lawyer, and it took him a long while to get the new books that he must have. He had begun to build a very large new house at Monticello, and so in the little end of this he now went to live. Two years later to this home, which was to become known all over the world, he brought his bride, Mrs. Martha Skelton, a young and very rich widow. They were married on New Year's Day, 1772, and came to their home in such a hard snowstorm that the horses could not drag the coach through the big drifts. So these two young folks left the warm coach and rode the tired horses up to the door of their new home. Jefferson and his wife gave great care to Monticello, and it was known far and near for its great beauty and for its choice and rare fruits and flowers. But Jefferson was much from home. In 1762, he was sent to Congress, and here at once stood at the head of the band of wise and great men who were then there. His mind was so clear and bright that in all the grave things that came up, he knew at once just what to do. He had the trust of all men. He was a great help in writing the Declaration of Independence. In fact, it may well be said that he wrote it. Soon after this great act, he left Congress and turned his mind to the laws of his own state. He made them safe and just for all men, both rich and poor. In 1779, he was made governor of Virginia. And now his work was hard. Not only must he find a way to keep the Indians from the houses of the white men, but the British came down to the south and laid his fair home in ruins. Not for long years did Monticello grow in beauty once more. But through all the dark years of war, Jefferson did his work well. He forced back the Indian foes and gave help and aid to his state while the war for independence went on. When the war was at an end, the strong, just man with his clear, wise brain was just the one to stand up for our rights in the lands across the sea. So he was sent to France at the time Adams was in England. While here, he had a bill passed by which England said she would look on our land as free. And this was a big point for us to gain. When Jefferson came home, he was made Secretary of State, and in this high office did much good work. It was he who first gave us our coins to use in place of the English coins, which up to that time had been in use here. Now, Alexander Hamilton was in charge of the work of making the coin, and a great feud came up between him and Jefferson as to how this should be done. Men, of course, took sides in this strife, and so two bands sprang up, which were known as Republicans and Federalists. Today, these two bands are known as Republicans and Democrats. Alexander Hamilton was killed in a duel by Aaron Burr in July 1804. In 1801, Jefferson was made president, and while he was in the chair, this land grew strong and great. Our first steamboat was built by Robert Fulton while Jefferson was president, and it did not look at all like the great boats of today. It was a heavy, clumsy boat, which went by sails as well as steam. Jefferson tried hard to put an end to the slave trade, which he felt was a great wrong. He thought, too, that folks should have the right to serve God in their own way, and he held that only men who could read and write should vote. He was a great and a wise man. Books were his dear friends, and so one of the hardest things he had to do after he went home to Monticello, when he left the White House, was to sell all his books to Congress in order to get money to live on. To his own home, hosts of friends and strangers came to see the great man, just as they had when he was in Washington. But he sold his books so cheap that the money did not help him much, 
and at last it seemed as if he must sell his dear old home. But now the people for whom he had done so much helped him, and a big fund was raised, so that he could keep his home and live there in comfort until his death. He lived to be a very old man, and even when he was so weak he could not rise from his bed, his great strong brain was still clear. You know that he died on the 4th of July, 1826, just a few hours before the death of his old friend John Adams. Next to the name of George Washington, there is no name among the great men of our land of which the people are so proud as that of Thomas Jefferson. End of chapter 3 Recording by Mark Peterson, Louisville, Kentucky, markjpeterson.com Chapter 4 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy Chapter 4 James Madison in the home of his grandfather at Port Conway, Virginia, was born, in the spring of 1751, the small boy who was to be our fourth president. He was very young, though, when he went to live at Montpelier, his father's great farm in Virginia, and here he led much the same life as George Washington did when a boy. He was but a small boy when the French and English War began and when Braddock lost the day, a great fear of the Indians spread to the very door of his home, and he grew up with the name of George Washington ever in his ears as a great hero. His school days were much like those of Jefferson. He was a young boy when he could read French and Spanish with ease, and was as well hard at work at Greek and Latin. In 1769 he went to Princeton College, and here, as well as when he was at home, Jefferson was a great help to him. The older man wrote to the boy in the quiet old college town about the scenes of war. He told him much of the British troops in the Boston streets, of young John Adams, and of Washington. So, when in 1771 he left college, he knew a great deal about the strife of the day, and had deep, clear thoughts about it. At home he led a quiet life with his books, until 1774. Then he was put at the head of a few men, who were to guard their own town if the British troops came there. In this post he showed such a wise, clear mind, and did his part so well, that in a short time he was put in a high place in his state, and from there in 1779 was sent to Congress. Jefferson was at this time governor of Virginia, and the two men were close, warm friends. For twenty-five years Madison was one of the first men in this land. He had no taste for war, but he soon took a high place with those who made the laws of the land. One of the great things he did was to help draw up the Constitution of the United States. In 1794 this grave and quiet man married, as Washington and Jefferson had done, a young and lovely widow. She was but twenty-two years old, twenty years younger than he, and her name was Mrs. Dorothy Payne Todd. Later on, the folks who grew to love this fair lady so well gave her the name by which we know her today, Dolly Madison. She was a Quakeress, and so fair and sweet was she, in her quiet little gown of gray, that once a friend said to her, Dolly, truly thou must hide thy face, so many stare at thee. For one year after his marriage, Madison lived at Montpelier. Then again he went into public life, first in his state, and after that, in 1800, as Secretary of State under Jefferson. 
Now began the gay life at the White House, for which Dolly Madison won so much fame. Jefferson's wife was dead, and was the wife of his friend that helped him entertain the White House guests. Well did this lovely lady do her part, in 1808, when, as the wife of the President, she became the real mistress of the White House. More than ever did the people love her. Today, of all the pictures of the President's wives that hang up on the White House walls, none is more lovely than that of the gay and pretty Dolly Madison. Madison was most of all a man of peace, and yet it was while he was in office that the United States was drawn into the War of 1812. England, then at war with France, said she had the right to search American ships to see if they were taking aid to France. America would not give this right to England, and so the war began. In 1814, the British came to the city of Washington, and for the only time in American history, the President had to leave his home. Madison, with the Secretary of State and some friends, went to a little inn near Washington, and here they were met by Mrs. Madison, who had stayed as long as she could at the White House to save some things from the hands of the British. She had brought the great Declaration of Independence, and had cut from its big frame the picture of Washington, and brought it safely away. The British troops set fire to the White House, the Navy Yard, the Capitol, and in fact the whole town. They left in great haste, though, when they heard that our troops were on the way. And the next day Mrs. Madison put on the dress of a washwoman, so folks would not know her, and made a start for her home. But the British had set fire to a bridge she had to cross on the way, and then she begged an American soldier to row her over the river. He would not do so until she told him who she was. And then he was very glad to take this brave little lady in his boat. Only black ashes marked the spot on which the White House had once stood, so she had to go to her sister's home, where the President soon joined her. The English troops now tried to take Baltimore, but our brave men drove them back, and when they tried to make a raid on New Orleans, General Jackson and his troops fought so hard that the foe could not get into the city. This was the last fight of this war, and peace was signed at Ghent, December 24, 1814. From that day, England has had to leave our ships alone, and to treat America as one of the great nations of the world. In 1817, Madison was not sorry to go back to his old home, and here many happy years were spent, for the fair lady of the White House kept open house in her own home, and guests from far and near were glad to come here. One of Madison's dearest friends was old Thomas Jefferson, who often rode over from his home at Monticello, which was only thirty miles from Montpelier. Madison rode a good deal at this time, and once again was seen in public life. In 1829, he was at the head of the great change made in all the laws of the whole land. He died after a long sickness at his home in Montpelier on June 28, 1836. End of chapter 4 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 5 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy Chapter 5. James Monroe James Monroe was, like Washington, Madison, and Jefferson, born in Virginia. Our first president was just 26 years old when, in Westmoreland County, on April 28, 1758, was born the boy who was to be the fifth president. His father, Colonel Spence Monroe, owned a big farm and was quite rich. Little James was sent to good schools and did not have to work to earn the means to stay in school. He learned at first to hunt, to skate, and to swim and was good friends with all the boys. But through all the fun and schoolwork came up the talk of war, of the long strife with England, and the fierce red men. 
it was hard for a brave boy to hear such talk and keep on at his books, and though Munro did go to William and Mary College, he did not stay long, for we hear of him in 1775 at the camp near Boston. In 1776 we see him at the head of a band of men, and from that time on he was in the thick of the fight. He fought at White Plains and Harlem Heights, and was so brave that the great Washington gave him high praise for his work, and made him, when but eighteen years old, a captain in the army. At the great fight at Trenton he got a bad wound and had to rest for some time. In the big fights of the war this brave young man was one of the first in the field. His hopes were ever high, and he put heart into the weak and worn men who looked to him for help in the sad years of the war. In 1780 he began the study of law with his old friend Thomas Jefferson, and soon led the bright men of the day. So good a friend of his was Jefferson, that the home to which Munro took his bride in 1785 was planned for him by Jefferson, who, so it is said, also gave him the nails to build it with. In 1794 he was sent to France to look out for America's rights, but he found talk of war there at that time. The people did not want a king any longer, but wished to become a free land like America, with a president at the head, and Madison, who was a Republican, took sides with the Republicans in France. The king did not like this, and so Madison had to come home at the end of two years. But he met with a welcome at home, and his own state made him its governor. In 1803 he was once more sent to France, this time to buy the state of Louisiana from the French, and he paid Napoleon for this large state fifteen million dollars. Twice Monroe was sent to Spain, and once to England, where his task was to force England to stop her search of American ships. You know he could not do this, for that was the cause of the War of 1812. Tired and sad at heart, he came back home, and was glad to rest for a while in his own home, but he was of too much use to his country to be idle long. Once more in 1811, he was made governor of Virginia. Then came the War of 1812, and it was Monroe, now Secretary of State, who at the head of a few men saw the British land near Washington and sent word to Madison to leave the city. He also acted as Secretary of War at this time, and so well did he do his part that in 1816 he was named for President by the Democrats. He got the most votes and so took the first place in our great land. His first act was to pay off the great debt which the War of 1812 had brought on us. He did this in a very short time, and now our trade grew so great that railroads were built, and so our first railroad was made while Madison was president. There was a fierce war with the Indians in Florida at this time, but General Jackson was sent down there and he forced them to lay down their arms and keep the peace. Just at this time, too, we got Florida from the King of Spain and gave up Texas after paying a big sum of money to the Americans who had been robbed by Spain. Missouri came into the Union while Monroe was president, and there was a fierce storm of words. The North said she should not hold slaves after she was a state. The South said that she should. At last Congress gave way to the southern states, but made a law that there should be a line drawn through the land, north of which no state should hold slaves. In 1825 Monroe was free to go to his home at Oak Hill, Virginia, and here he lived until 1830. His wife died in that year, and then he went to live with his daughter in New York. He died here on the 4th of July, 1831, and his name is one that the whole land loves and honours. He was buried in New York, but on the 100th anniversary of his birth, his body was taken to Richmond, Virginia, and a handsome stone raised over his grave. End of section 5 Chapter 6 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy John Quincy Adams The little boy who became our sixth president led a life not at all like that of any other of the boys whom you have read. His father was John Adams, our second president, and when, on July 11th, 1767, little John Quincy Adams was born in the old home at Braintree, Massachusetts, his great father was already speaking bravely for his country's rights in the city of Boston. In 1772 the family moved to Boston, and little John, for two years, saw, as the other boys did, the British soldiers in their bright red coats on parade in the Boston streets, and heard on all sides talk of war with England. He saw a little of real war too, for when he was eight years old his mother took him on top of a high hill, 
called Bemis Hill, from which he saw the smoke and heard the roar of cannon in that awful battle of Bunker Hill. When, in 1776, the British left Boston, this little lad of nine years used to often ride on horseback in and out of the city to bring home the latest news. This was a ride of twenty-two miles from the old home at Braintree, where Mrs. Adams had gone when her husband went to Congress, and I think it took a pretty brave and strong boy to ride all those long miles alone. When John Adams went to France to try and get her aid for America, he took with him his little boy, then ten years old. It was a rough, hard trip, for not only were there fierce winds which lashed the waves into fury, but they were chased by British ships, for England did not want John Adams to get this help from France. But they reached Paris in safety, and little John was at once put in a French school. He only stayed for about a year, and went back home with his father in the spring. Now for three months he was with his mother, and then in November he and some other boys who were placed in his father's care all started for France, where they were to be put in a good school. This trip was harder than the other one, for the big ship, Sensible, sprang a leak, and after some days of great peril, they were glad to go to the nearest land, which was Spain, and now there was a long, hard trip by land before France could be reached. They had sailed on November 13th, 1779, and it was not until February 5th, 1780, that the little party reached Paris. For two years now, our little lad was hard at work with his books in Paris, then his father was sent to the Netherlands as American minister, and he took his little son there and placed him in a school in Amsterdam. From here he went to the university at Leiden, where he stayed until July 1781. He was now only fourteen years old, but you see he had been in so many lands that he could speak as the folks did in those strange lands, and this was a rare thing in those days. In 1781 Francis Dana, then the American minister to Russia, needing someone to help him in his work, sent to Leyden for this young boy. They passed through Germany on the way to Russia, and here John Quincy learned something of another new land. Then, after a year in Russia, he left Mr. Dana and studied for a year in Sweden. The next spring he went to his father in Holland, and then went to Paris with him, and was present when the Treaty of Peace between England and America ended the War of Independence. For two years more he studied abroad, and then sailed for home in May 1783. He at once entered the junior class at Harvard College and graduated with next to the highest honours in 1787. Then he took up law, as his father had done, and began to practice in Boston. He made few friends. Folks did not love him as they had either Madison or Monroe, but he was always known to be a man of great power and of great learning, and knowing so much of other lands, he was just the man to be sent as American minister to these countries. In 1794, Washington sent him to Holland, and in 1796, he was sent to Berlin. When in 1801, Adams came back home, it was to find new honours waiting for him. He was sent first to the State Senate, and then to Congress. You see, the steps by which our presidents rose to power were much the same in every case. A duty well done in a small place led to something a little higher, and so on to the greatest honour of all, the President's Chair. The state of Massachusetts was very proud of John Quincy Adams. Not only was he a great statesman and the son of the man whom they all loved, but he was as well a fine scholar and a brilliant speaker. In 1809 he was sent abroad again for his country, this time to Russia, where he had not been since he was a boy of 14. In 1815 he was sent to France, but he was here only a few months when war broke out in France and all the ministers from other countries were called away. He went at once to England, and here he had a much more pleasant time than his father had when he went there as the first American minister. The United States was now known as a big strong country, and no one dared to be rude to her minister. In 1817 his own land felt the need of the great man who had served her so well abroad, and he was called home to become Secretary of State. No man was so well fitted for this post as he, for there were many men from the lands across the sea now coming and going in the capital of the United States to talk over great questions. There were new states coming into the Union, and other lands were always trying to gain a little power here. So John Quincy Adams, who not only was a great scholar and a fine lawyer, but also knew well so many lands besides his own, was just the man to help President Monroe through his eight years of work. He was also the man best suited for the president's chair at the end of Monroe's term of office. Not once, while Adam was in Washington working hard, did he forget his old father, watching in his home at Quincy the busy life of his great son. Once every year he went to the quiet old home and told his father of the life in Washington, in which the older man had once held so great a place. 
At the age of 68, Adams went back to his home in Quincy, but in 1830 once more he was sent to Congress, and for 16 years he kept his seat there. He grew old and gray serving his native land. He made bitter enemies, but many warm friends. He feared no one, and his voice was always for the freedom of this great land. On November 19th, 1846, he had a stroke of paralysis while walking in Boston, but three months later saw him again in Washington, and taking his old seat in Congress. As the grey old man came feebly into the hall, every man present rose to his feet, and so stood until he took his seat. He was too weak now to talk, and only once more did he try to speak his mind on one of the great questions of the day. This was on February 21st, 1848. He rose to speak, but fell into the arms of a man near him. At once they took him into a cloakroom and sent for his wife. For two days did he lay there, and then, on the morning of February 23rd, his great soul took its flight. His last words were, This is the last of life, and I am content. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy Chapter 7 Andrew Jackson The boy who was to be our seventh president did not lead the sort of life, as boy or man, that the other presidents did. He was the son of a poor Irishman who came here from Ireland in 1765. He was born on March 15, 1767, in a small place in South Carolina, called the Waxhaw Settlements. Poor and mean was the log house in which he first saw the light, and when his father died, which was when Andrew was a wee baby, the life of the little home was harder yet. His mother was a brave, good woman, and so well did she do her hard part in life that she was loved by all who knew her, and was known far and near as Aunt Betty. Andrew was a great care to her when a boy, for, full of life and fun, he did not care for books, and was at the head in all sorts of wild sports. He was ever ready for a fight with boys who made him angry. The small boys looked to him for help in any strife with boys bigger than they, and so strong was he or ready to knock a boy down for a real or a fancied wrong, that they soon found it best to give him his own way, and let him take his place as leader among them. When he was at the head, all went well. He was just nine years old when the Declaration of Independence was signed, and then came four years of war with England. In 1780, this war was carried into the South, and on May 29th, a number of British soldiers under Colonel Tarleton killed and wounded over two hundred of the men and boys from the Waxhaw settlements. Among those who helped to care for the hurt and dying men were Mrs. Jackson and her boys. Andrew was only fourteen when he fell into the hands of the British, and he, with over one hundred sick and dying men, were kept for days in a dirty pen, with no beds, little to eat, and only stale water to drink. To make things worse, smallpox broke out, and Andrew was one of those who had it. His brave mother was at last able to free him, and it was owing to her loving care that he did not die at this awful time. After he was well enough to be left, his mother, who was very sorry for the poor American soldiers, went to Charleston to take care of those who were sick and wounded here. Just as she had begun her noble work, she was taken sick and died. Soon after her death came the good news of peace, and now young Andrew began to pay some heed to his books, with the hope of studying law. He also taught school for a while, though he could not have been a very good teacher, for he never learned how to spell very well himself. 
Still, in 1787, we find he has learned enough to take up the practice of law, and he began this work in Nashville, Tennessee. And now we see the boy who had been the leader in boyish sports, games, and fights, become at once a leader among men. He was tall and quite good-looking, with bright blue eyes and reddish hair, and he was full of fun and life. He rode horseback well, and knew how to shoot straight, and above all he was a brave man, afraid of nothing. In 1788 he was given a place in which he had to try for the state all men who had done wrong, and it needed, in those wild days, in that new land, a brave man for such a work, for he would make many foes, both among the bad white men and the Indians. His work took him from Nashville to Jonesboro, and here the Indians were very strong and very cruel, killing and robbing the white men and women and even the little babies in their mother's arms. Hearing and seeing day by day more and more of this savage warfare, always in danger of being killed by night or day by some Indian hiding behind a tree or house, Jackson learned to know the Indians in their habits better than most men did, so was ready to fight them in their own way in a few years. He made his home in Nashville and built up a good law practice. He grew in power so fast that in 1797 he was sentenced as the first man from Tennessee to Congress. He went all the way from his home to Philadelphia, a distance of 800 miles, on horseback. In 1798 we see him again at home as judge of the Supreme Court, and here he stayed until 1804. Then came fourteen years of peace for the land, and a happy home life for him. Among other things which Jackson did at this time, was to build a large log store in which he kept all sorts of things which both the white men and the Indians wanted. His home, which was called the Hermitage, was a fine house for those days, and in later years it grew as well known as Mount Vernon and Monticello. Jackson was all through his life a man who would stand up for his own way, if it led to strife with his best friend, and more than once he fought duels to the death. In Congress he would, when he rose to speak, sometimes choke with blind rage if he could not make his point and force men to yield to him. After years of peace came the War of 1812, and from that hour Jackson's name was first in the minds of men. He showed great skill in his fights with the Red Men, and won much fame in a fierce fight with the Creeks, a bad tribe of Indians in Alabama. He could force men to do as he said, the young men of that day looked up on him with awe and fear, but rushed to fill his ranks and serve under him. In 1815 he won the day at New Orleans, and put the British troops to flight with great loss of life. At the end of the war, back home went Jackson for the rest of which he stood in sore need. But, in 1818, strife with the Seminole Indians in Florida came up, and Jackson was sent there. At this time Spain owned Florida, and it was both Spanish troops and Indian foes that Jackson had to meet, but he won his way, and at last made Spain yield her rights in Florida and sign a peace. In 1823 she sold Florida to us for five million dollars, not such a great sum when we think what a rich and great place this land of flowers is. Jackson was now put at the head of things in Florida, and the hardest part of his work was to keep peace in the bad tribe of Seminole Indians. With their chief Osceola at their head, they would creep out from the woods and swamps of Florida, rush on the homes of the white men, and burn them to the ground, and then dash back to the woods, where they could safely hide. At the end of four years, Jackson was glad to go home to the Hermitage. Here he and his wife led a quiet life, and kept up many of the ways of their young days though now they were quite rich. After dinner, they would sit, one on each side of the great big wood fire, in the large hall, and smoke their old pipes with the long stems, just as they had in their log cabin of long ago. But the great general could not live this quiet life long. In 1823 he was sent to Congress, and here he met with high honor. On New Year's Day, 1824, the great men of the day gave him the pocket telescope that Washington had owned. 
a year from the day on which the Battle of New Orleans was fought. John Quincy Adams gave him a great feast, at which were men who held high rank here and in other lands. And on the day that he was fifty-seven years old, President Monroe gave him a gold badge for his brave acts in his fights for his country. In 1828 this rough but brave and kind old man was made president, and now he stood up for his own way, just as he had in the wars of his land, and when he was but a boy. His first act was to stop some states in the South from leaving the Union. John C. Calhoun was at the head of a band of men who felt that the North had more rights than the South, had more than its share of wealth and land, so rose the wish to set up a rule just for the South. But, said Jackson, if one state goes out, others will, and our great land will be a ruin. So he stopped this plan just in time. All the years that Jackson was president, our great land gained in strength. New railroads were built, and new steamboats. The land grew rich year by year. In 1824, the slaves in Mexico were set free, and Texas came into the Union. On the whole, Jackson's term was a good one for the land, and so well did the people like him, that he is the only president of whom it has been said that he was better liked when he went out of office than when he went in. The last years of his life were spent at the Hermitage, where he died on June 8, 1845. End of Chapter 7 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 8 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy Chapter 8 The Life of Martin Van Buren The place in which Martin Van Buren was born was far from the homes of the other boys who became our presidents, and his life as a boy was not one bit like theirs. His father and mother were Dutch, Hose was his mother's queer name, and the name of the small town in which, on December 5th, 1782, he was born, was Dutch too. Kinderhook, the little town was on the Hudson River, way up in New York State. His father kept a good inn and had a small farm, so he could send Martin to good schools. Martin was so quick and bright at his books that he took up the study of law when he was fourteen, and at twenty-one he was a lawyer and at work in Kinderhook. He was a man who made friends with great ease, and as he was a good lawyer as well, his state soon saw that he was the man to speak for it at Washington. So in 1821 he was sent to Congress, then in 1828 he was made governor of New York State, and this was a big step towards the president's chair. He was Secretary of State when Jackson was president, and in 1837 he took the oath of office and became president. He was in office only one term, and those four years were hard ones for him. Just at this time the men in Canada tried to be free from England and have home rule, and some of our men took sides with them. This made England angry, of course, and if Van Buren had not put a stop to such things, we should have had war once more. But he said all who tried to give aid to Canada should be sent to jail, and so the fear of war was put down. At the end of Van Buren's first term, some wanted him to take their chair again, but more wanted General Harrison, who had made a great name in the Indian Wars. Van Buren was rich, and Harrison was poor, and this race for the president's chair was called the, quote, log cabin against the White House, end quote. 
After Harrison took the chair, Van Buren went back to his home at Kinderhook, where he lived in quiet, until, in 1848, he was once more put up for president. But James K. Polk had more votes than he, and so won the election. In 1853, Van Buren and his son went to Europe, where they stayed two years. He spent the rest of his life at his old home, where he died on July 24, 1862. End of Chapter 8 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 9 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano lives of the presidents told in words of one syllable by jean s remy chapter nine william henry harrison william henry harrison was born in berkeley virginia on february ninth seventeen seventy three his father benjamin harrison was not a rich man but lived at ease on a small farm. He was a man of much force in his state, and was at one time its governor. He was a brave, strong man, and taught his small son to be like him. Now, while little William was hard at work at school, he heard much talk of the Indian Wars, and his heart was full of longing to fight those cruel foes of the white men. So, Though he went to Hampton Sydney College, he did not stay long, but left to join the army. He was such a brave fighter that, when he was twenty-one, Washington put him in charge of the troops at Fort Washington, just the place where the Indians were strongest and most cruel. Major General Wayne was at the head of the army, and so rash and fearless was he that his troops called him Mad Anthony. He knew well how to fight the red men, though, and in 1794 beat them in a fierce fight on the spot where the city of Detroit now stands. So brave was young Harrison at this time that he was made a captain. For six years Harrison was in the heat of the Indian Wars and learned all the savage ways of war. Then he went home to rest, but was soon sent to Congress. So well did he do his work here, that Indiana now chose him for governor, and here he was so much liked that he kept his seat three terms. The hardest task that he had to do while governor was to keep peace with the Indians, and side by side with his name stands that of a great and good Indian chief, Tecumseh. For years these two men tried to help the Indians and teach them to live in peace. But at last the hate of the red men for the whites, who were forcing them from their lands, ended in a great fight at Tippecanoe, where the Indians lost the battle. So brave had Harrison been in this fight, that he was made a general, and in the War of 1812 was put at the head of the army. At the close of the war, the brave old Indian fighter went to live on his farm at South Bend, Indiana, in the then state of Ohio. But he was too great a man to live a quiet life, and was sent to Congress twice, and once abroad in his country's service. Then, in 1836, he ran for president, but did not get the most votes. Four years later, he was put up once more, and he and John Tyler won by a big vote. It was in this race for president that the song was sung, whose chorus you hear today. Tippecanoe and Tyler too. On the 4th of March, 1841, William Henry Harrison, the old Indian fighter, now 68 years old, came from years of quiet home life to take up the cares and worries of a president's life. But the task was too much for him, and a month afterward, 
on April 4th, 1841, the brave old man died. End of Chapter 9 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 10 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Lives of the Presidents told in words of one syllable by jean s remy chapter ten john tyler as a boy the life of john tyler was much the same as that of the boys of today he was born on march twenty ninth seventeen ninety in charles city virginia at a time when the whole land was at peace no talk of the red men came to his young ears and no fear fell like a dark cloud over the fun and play of his boyhood. He was the son of a man who had for friends the great men of his day. Washington and Benjamin Harrison were warm, close friends of old John Tyler, and he was at one time governor of Virginia. Young John was sent to school when he was a very small boy, and, though he was fond of sports and games, he kept hard at work at his books, and won a high place at school. He was a mere boy when he could enter William and Mary College, and he left in 1806 at the head of his class. He at once took up law with his father, and soon showed the good stuff of which he was made. Clear and quick was his mind, swift to think and feel, and his words came as fast as his thoughts. He rose with great quick strides towards the first place in the land, in 1825 he was made governor of Virginia, and in 1827 was sent to Congress, where he kept his seat for six years. These were years of strife as to the slave trade, and there were fierce, hard words and harsh thoughts between the men of the North and those of the South. Tyler was at home for a few years after he left Congress, and took a high place as a lawyer. In 1836, he was put up with Harrison in the race for the president's chair. But it was not till 1840 that he won this place. Then, as the vice president had not a great deal to do, Tyler went home to Williamsburg. It was here that the sad news of Harrison's death was brought to him, and he at once went on to Washington. Here he found he had a hard task, for he and his Congress did not think the same on the great questions of the day and were ever at strife. One of his first acts was to put down a state war in Missouri. A Mormon by the name of Smith, and a band of men who thought as he did, went down there to live. Folks there did not like this, and tried to drive them out of the state. But this was a hard thing to do, for there were about twelve thousand Mormons. At last, Tyler sent troops there to put down the strife and the Mormons were sent to Illinois. They were here but a short time, when the same old strife arose, and then they fled to the lands in the far west, where they are today, in the state of Utah. War broke out in Texas, while Tyler was in the chair, and after fierce fights between the Texans and Mexicans, the Texans won, and were at the head of the state. They asked at once to come into the Union, and in 1845, this great state came in. In the last year of Tyler's rule, Samuel F. B. Morse found out how to send words in just a flash of time through miles and miles of space, and you children know well that the fine wire stretched from one great pole to the next on which the quick news was sent was called the telegraph. At the end of Tyler's first term, James Knox Polk had the most votes, and so took the president's chair and this news was the first that was sent over the telegraph wires. End of chapter 10 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida
Chapter 11 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Lives of the Presidents told in words of one syllable by jean s remy chapter eleven james knox polk as a boy james knox polk led a life that would please a good many of the boys of today he was born in mecklenburg county north carolina on november second seventeen ninety five but in eighteen o six his father went to duck farm tennessee and little James, eleven years old, was of much help in the new home. Where the day's work took the big, strong father, there went the small son. If there was a long ride to get food or clothes from some big town, little James could help care for the horses, and when his father and other men, for weeks at a time, were in the great wild woods, hunting, making new roads, or helping each other build the log cabins, which were the homes of these early settlers. James would be there, too, cooking meals and keeping the camp neat and bright for the men, who came back tired and hungry at night. So years passed by with much work in the open air, and little of study or books. But when James was fourteen years old, it was time that he should earn money. He was not a big, strong boy. He could not stand rough, hard work on a farm. He did not love to hunt. He had no taste for war, so he was put in a small store that he might learn to manage a big store when he grew old. Here he first saw some books, and his love for them awoke. For weeks and months he worked alone with any book or paper he could find. At last his father took him from the store and sent him to school. He was now eighteen, but he was so quick to learn, so bright and smart, that five years from this time he left the University of North Carolina at the head of his class. When he came back to Duck River, not only was his father proud of his boy, but all Tennessee knew that he was one of the brightest young men in the state. Now, just at this time, General Jackson was fighting so bravely against the Indians, and all the boys of Tennessee were as proud of this great hero as the boys of Virginia had been of Washington. In 1819, when young James Polk went to Nashville, Tennessee, to take up law, he was near Jackson's home, and he and the great general became fast friends. It was owing to Jackson's help that, in 1824, Polk, then a bright young lawyer, took his first public step and was sent to the state legislature. He arose so fast in the love and trust of his state that he was sent to Congress when only thirty years old, and here he stayed for thirteen years. In 1840, he went back to his home at Grundy's Hill in Nashville, having made a great name in Washington. Not once did he lose his hold on the great questions of the day, even while here at home, and in 1845 he was chosen President of the United States. While he was in office, once more the United States was at war, and this war is known as the Mexican War. Its cause was this. Our people in Mexico said that a big tract of land down there was theirs. The Mexicans laid claim to it, too. So General Taylor went down to see that our rights were looked after. In the first fight he won, and lost but nine men. Then he laid siege to the great city of Monterey, and after a hard fight took the town. That same year General Scott took the city of Veracruz. On September 14, 1847, the American troops took the city of Mexico, and the long war was at an end. In 1848 came the news of great gold mines in California, and men went in such numbers to this state that the gold fever of 1849 is a well-known term today. While Polk was in the chair, three new states came in, and two of them were free states, that is, no slaves could be kept there. Just at this time, some men formed a band, 
and said that no slaves should be kept in any new state which the United States should gain. In 1849, Polk went home to Nashville, Tennessee. He was only 58 years old, but he was so worn out with years of work that he lived but a few months after he got home. He died on the 15th of June in the same year. End of Chapter 11 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 12 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Lives of the Presidents told in words of one syllable by jean s remy chapter twelve zachary taylor zachary taylor was born in virginia on november twenty fourth seventeen eighty four but when he was a small boy his father went to live in kentucky and long after the rest of the land was at peace this state was the scene of such fierce fights with the indians that it was known as the dark and bloody ground. It is not strange that this boy, who lived at a time when women as well as men had to know how to load and fire guns, so that they could help to keep the red men from their homes, should have grown up to be a brave, strong man. As a boy he went to good schools, but cared far more for the tales of war which his brave father told him than he did for his books. He did love books, which told of great fights and brave men, and read all that he could get. When he was just of age he went to war, in place of a friend, and was so brave and fearless that he soon took a high place. He was in the great fight of Tippecanoe, and all through the War of 1812 he showed great skill in his fights with the Red Men. Well, he knew all their tricks and modes of war. He gained great fame in Florida when he was sent there to make the Seminole Indians keep the peace. For years had this tribe of Indians made war on the white men. Their chief, Osceola, had, years ago, gone to one of the forts with his wife, who was a slave girl. He had been put in chains, and she held at the fort. In his rage he had sworn to lead his men in war, when he could get to them, and at last his chance had come, and he had fled by night from the fort. To rouse his tribe and hurl them at the whites was his first thought, and long and cruel were the fights that went on for years. At last Taylor was sent to Florida, and now a trick was played on this great chief of the Indians. With a flag of truce, he came to the fort to talk with the general, and by the orders of the general he was held there a prisoner. He was sent at last to Fort Moultrie in Charleston Harbor, and there, in the year 1838, he died. With their chief dead, the Seminole Indians had no heart for war, and soon the few red men left of this great, fierce tribe were put far away from each other in new states, and there was peace in Florida. General Taylor won great fame in the Mexican War. In 1847 he won the fight of Buena Vista, which took place on Washington's birthday, and he won, too, the fights of Palo Alto and Monterey. On September 24, 1847, our troops took the city of Mexico, and the war was brought to an end. As Taylor went home to Baton Rouge, he met with praise. At each place he passed, folks came in crowds to see the great hero. Cheers filled the air. Flags were raised and guns were fired. He was the idol of the land. His men, too, were fond of him, for all through the war he had been kind and good to them and shared their hard life. He was such a hero to the whole land, that it is not strange that he was named the next president, and got the most votes. He took the chair of state in 1849, but the brave old man came in just at the time when the strife about slaves was at its height, and the cares of the office were too much for him, as they had been for Harrison. On July 4, 1850, 
there was a great time in Washington, in which he took part, but his health was too weak to stand this strain, and in the midst of his work, on July ninth, 1850, the brave old Indian fighter died. End of Chapter 12 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 13 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz of Wellington, Kansas. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy Chapter 13 Millard Fillmore. In a log cabin way out in the western part of New York State, deep in the dense wild woods, was born on January 7, 1800, the boy who was to be the 13th President of the United States. His father had gone there from Vermont to get away from the Indians, who gave no peace in his old home and no house stood nearer than four miles to the little home he had built in the wild new land. There was no school, and if there had been, little Millard had not much time to go, for he was very young. When he was taught to earn money and help in the little home, he learned how to make cloth from the soft white wool and was hard at work in this way till he was nineteen years old. Then a love of books came to him, and a lawyer took note of him and gave him such aid that he soon took a high place in the law studies. When he was twenty-two, he went to Buffalo and taught school to help pay his way as he went on with the study of law. He was bright and quick, and in 1823, he began to practice law and soon rose to such a high place in the state bar that his state sent him to Congress. Here his work was done so well that he was made vice president when Taylor took the president's seat and on his death became president. While he was in the chair, one of his aides was the great Daniel Webster, who looked after the laws of all the states. He had been in office but a short time when a band of men tried to get Cuba from Spain, but they were soon put down. He was in office one term and then went home to Buffalo and took up the practice of law again. In 1855, he went to Europe, where he stayed for one year, he then came home to lead a quiet life full of study till his death on March 8, 1874. End of chapter. Chapter 14 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy Chapter 14 Franklin Pierce A brave soldier in the War of the Revolution was Benjamin Pierce, the father of the boy who was to be our 14th President, and it was in the old town of Hillsborough, New Hampshire, that on November 22nd, 1804, Franklin Pierce was born. The father was a big strong man, fond of sports and fun of all kinds, and much liked by all. He was the chief man in Hillsborough, and was at one time governor of his state. In such a home it is not hard to see that the life of little Franklin would be full of work and play as well. He was sent to good schools, and was just sixteen when he went to Bowdoin College. He was full of fun, and at once took the lead in college life, but he worked hard at his books too. In 1824 he left college and took up the study of law, and soon became one of the bar. 
He was now at his old home in Hillsborough, and folks felt that he was a man of brains and great force. He was sent to Congress, and held high office in his state while he was still a young man, and in the Mexican War he showed himself as brave a man as his father had been. At last, in 1853, he was made president. At this time, the strife as to the slave trade was at its height. Some states wished to have slaves, while some held it wrong. At last Congress made a law that all new states should do as they pleased. The first World's Fair was held in New York, just at this time, in a great hall made of glass which was known as the Crystal Palace. Pierce was in office one term. At the end of that time he went back home to Concord, Massachusetts, where he lived a quiet life until his death on October 8, 1867. End of section 14「Chapter 15 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Greg Giordano Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy Chapter 15 James Buchanan A strong, brave young man from Ireland was the father of our 15th president. He had come here in 1783 and bought a small farm in Pennsylvania. So well did he do that he soon bought a store as well, and when, on April 23, 1791, at Cove Gap, little James was born, his father was quite a rich man. He sent his son to the best schools, and he was just sixteen years old when he went to Dickinson College. Here he took first place with ease. In 1809, when he left college, he began the study of law. In the War of 1812, he served in the army, and at the close of the war, his state chose him to help make her laws. He was a young man when his state sent him to Washington, where he held his place in Congress for ten years. In 1831, he was sent to Russia to look out for our rights there, and in 1853, he held the same post in England. You see, he rose fast to the first place in the land, for in 1857 he was made president. While he was in the chair of state, the Prince of Wales came here for the first time, and this shows that England felt we were now one of the big countries of the world, and that she must treat us as such. It was while Buchanan was president that Cyrus W. Field laid the first wire under the ocean by which words could be sent from this new land to those old lands on the other side. The talk about slavery was so fierce at this time that a fight in which brave lives were lost took place, and the name which shines out bright is that of John Brown, of Kansas. He was a friend of the black men, and took their part. He struck the first blow in their cause at the fort at Harper's Ferry, which he held for two days. He took all the guns that were there, as he wished to arm the black men, and then lead them to the south to fight for their friends, held there as slaves. Of course this was against the law of the land, and troops were sent to seize this brave and good man. His two sons fought with him, and he saw them both shot down, but he did not give up till in the heat of the fight he fell with six wounds. He did not die at this time. After this he was hung as one who had fought against the law of the land. His last act, as he was on his way to the place where he was to be hung, was to kiss a little baby which a poor slave held up to him as he passed. His death was not in vain, for from now on the question of slavery was a talk of the whole land, and in 1860 South Carolina took the lead and said that she would not bear the laws of the Union but would rule her land in her own way. Soon, six more southern states said the same, and these states which cut loose from the north were called the Confederacy. At the head as president was Jefferson Davis. 
This was the state of things when Buchanan left the chair and went to his home in Pennsylvania, at a place called Wheatland. In the last year of his life he wrote a book of his life, which is still in print. He died at his home on June 1, 1868. He was the last of the peace presidents, for it was Abraham Lincoln who took his place, and in his term the strife as to the slave trade led to our civil war. End of chapter 15 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 16 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Justice Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy Abraham Lincoln Thomas Lincoln, who was the father of Abraham Lincoln, had seen a sad sight when he was but a boy of eight years, while he and his brothers were hard at work with their father in the dense wild woods, which grew close to their small home in Kentucky. An Indian chief crept close to them. He fired one shot, and the boys saw their big strong father fall dead. They were brave boys, and while one ran for help, the others kept at bay the Indians who came from the woods. A band of men soon came to their aid and drove the fierce red men back to the woods. It was a rough, hard life in which Thomas Lincoln grew up, and he could not read or write when, at twenty years, he took as his wife Miss Nancy Hanks. She was a bright girl, and soon taught him at least to write his name. It was a poor log house in Hardin County, Kentucky, to which he took his bride, and yet in this home, so mean and small, was born, on February 12, 1809, the boy who was to be president of this great land. Few boys and girls know what it is to be as poor as this little boy was, or to lead as hard and sad a life. His clothes were thin and poor. His shoes, when he had any, were often full of holes. He did not always have as much as he would like to eat, and in the long, hard winters he was often very cold. It was not an easy life, and it was full of hard work, for people in this rough place could not read, and there were no schools. But when he was still a young boy, his folks moved to Indiana, and though there was more work to be done, life was not quite so sad, for he and his sister Nancy now had a playmate, their cousin Dennis Hanks, who was full of life and fun. Abe, as folks called him, was but eight years old when his parents went out into the West to live, but he was so strong that he could help chop down the trees of which the new home was made, then, too, he learned how to shoot the game and wild fowl in the big woods, and so could bring good things into the house to eat. But a dark time came in his life soon, for the kind, good mother took sick and died. Her death was a great loss to Abe, and he felt much grief that there was no one to say a prayer at her grave. So he wrote to the minister in the old home in Kentucky, and asked him if he would not come there and bless his mother's grave. This good man came as soon as he could, but it was a long while after her death before Abe had his wish. That winter was long and hard for the poor little boy and girl with no mother to see that they were warm or that they had good food to eat. But in the fall of 1819, the father brought home a new wife, Mrs. Sally Johnson, and now at last a ray of bright light came to stay with Abe and Nancy. The new mother was a good, kind woman and was quite rich for those days. She soon had the home bright and neat. She put good warm clothes on Abe and Nancy, saw that they had food to eat, and at once sent them to school. Abe was now eleven years old, tall and big, and of more strength than most boys of his age. His father hired him out for all sorts of work, to pitch hay, to chop wood, to help on the farm. No work was too hard for this big strong boy, but with all this work he kept at his books too. Late at night, while all the rest slept, he would study his books, and his books were few, he read them many times over. One of the books he loved the most was The Life of Washington. He was a young man for it was in March 1828 that a chance came to him to see more of life. He was hired to take a boat filled with skins down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. He did this well, and when he came back was paid a good price for it. He was just of age when his folks went to Illinois to live, and now he helped build a home, cleared a big field in which it stood, split rails to fence it in, and then went off to make his own way in life. The first thing he did was to help build a flatboat, and then take it down to New Orleans. 
When he came back, the man who owned the boat gave him a place in the store at New Salem. And now he had a good chance to get books to read, and you may be sure he was glad of this. He was soon known in the place as a bright young man, and one who would not lie, or steal, or do any mean thing. He was full of fun and jokes, and the folks in the town were all fond of him. He was called Honest Abe. When the Black Hawk War broke out, he went at the head of a small band of men to the seat of war. He was in no great fight, but learned much of war and how to rule the rough men who were in his care. When he came home, he was felt to be one of the first men in the town, and in 1834 he took a high place in the state. He now took up the study of law and was soon in active practice. He had a good kind heart and did much good to those who were too poor to pay him. In 1846, he was sent to Congress. This time, he was there but one year, then came back to Springfield, Illinois, and built up a fine law practice. His name was now known through all this great land, and in the slave strife, he was always on the side of the slaves. He spoke so often for the slaves that in 1860, the South said if he was put up for president by the North and West, they would leave the Union. But he was just the man to fill this high office at this time and as he had the most votes, he took the office of president in 1861. There is a story told of these days, which shows that Lincoln, when a great man, had no shame for the days when he was poor. Old John Hanks, who helped him build that rail fence so long ago, came to Illinois with two of those rails, and on them was a big card which told where they came from and who split them. Lincoln was just about to make a speech to a big crowd, and when he saw these rails, he said that he had split them when a boy but thought he could do better now. Then shouts and cheers went up from the crowd, you may be sure, and from that time Lincoln was known in the race for president as the rail splitter. When he left his home to go to Washington, a great crowd came to see him off, but he was so sad he could not say much to them. There were plots to kill him at this time, and he knew it, but he gave no thought of his own life and went straight to his post of duty as president. It was with a sad heart that he saw this great land torn with war and he would have been glad to keep peace, but this he could not do. When the South fired at the flag of the Union at Fort Sumter, a cry went up through the whole land. The South fought for what it called states' rights, the right of each state to rule in its own way. But this Lincoln would not have. He cared more for the Union than he did for the slaves, for though he thought all men should be free, he said, if he could save the Union, he did not care if not one slave was made free. He had no wish to keep the South from its rights. But at last... He felt it wise to send out a bill which said that all slaves should be free and had the same rights as white men. This land was in no state for war. Much had to be done. Clothes and food got for the troops, and arms as well had to be made or bought at once. The first great fight was at Bull Run in Virginia, and the loss of life on both sides was great. The North lost from the first. Men who had never been in a fight before went mad with fear and ran for their lives. But at the fight at Gettysburg, the men of the North were brave and fought with such skill that the great fight was won by the North. Grant was put at the head of the troops who went down to free Mississippi, and it was not long before he placed the stars and stripes over this fair state. The South made a brave fight for what it thought was right and just. But as the war went on, the troops of the South were in a bad state. They could get no food, no clothes, and so many men had been shot in the last years of the war, young boys had to help fill up the ranks. Now came Sherman's march to the sea, and he took Savannah and all its guns and stores. This was a great blow, and now one by one the seaports of the South fell into the hands of the North. At last General Lee, a great and good man of the South, sent word to Grant that he would come to terms and make peace. Grant was kind at this hard time. He let Lee keep his sword, and said that the men might keep all their horses. It was in April 1865 that peace came to our great land. And the North went mad with joys. Bells pealed and fires blazed in the streets. Flags were raised and guns were fired. But in the South there was no joy, only great grief. From the grief of the South a great crime sprang. On the night of April 14th, as Lincoln sat in a box at the theater watching a play, he was shot by a man from the South named Wilkes Booth. When he had shot Lincoln, this man sprang on the stage and tried to run from the place. He fell and broke his leg, but in this state he got to the door, where he jumped on his horse and fled for his life. He was found at last in a barn, and made such a brave fight for his life that the barn had to be set on fire before he could be caught. Even then he would not come out and give himself up, but fought till he was shot down where he stood. 
Lincoln had been shot in the back of his head and could not move or speak. Men took him with care to a house nearby, but there was no help for him, and in the early morn of the next day a great life came to a sad end. The whole land, the south as well as the north, wept at his death, for no sane man felt that Booth's deed was wise or just, and to this day the name of Abraham Lincoln, the savior of his country, is held dear by north and south. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano lives of the presidents told in words of one syllable by jean s remy chapter seventeen andrew johnson andrew johnson's life as a boy was quite as hard as that of little abe lincoln he was born in raleigh north carolina on december twenty ninth eighteen o eight in a small log cabin and near his home were the big farms of the rich men of the South, on which lived in more ease than he the slaves, who looked down on his father and mother as poor white trash. His father died when Andrew was but four years old. He must have been a brave man, for he lost his life trying to save a man from drowning. Little Andrew was too poor to go to school. He had to try and earn money. When he was but ten years old, so he was sent to a tailor to learn to make clothes. Here, for five years, he worked hard. And then he heard a man read, and for the first time it came to his mind that he could learn to do this. He got the men in the shop to teach him his ABCs, and he was so quick to learn that soon he could read a little. But it was not till he was wed to a bright young girl that he learned a great deal of books. This was when he was eighteen, and he had gone to Greenville, Tennessee, to set up in life for himself. These young folks were both poor, but both bright, and the wife was a great help to Johnson all through his life. He rose fast in his new home, and we see him, from the first, take the part of the poor, and he was soon put in high office in the town. It was not long ere he rose to a high place in the state and in eighteen forty three we see the poor little tailor boy of eighteen twenty six in the halls of congress standing up for the rights of the class in which he was born in eighteen forty six he took the seat of john quincy adams who was too sick to hold it does it not seem strange that two men who had lived as boys so unlike should rise to just the same place for ten years he was in washington where he helped make the laws of the land. Then, in 1853, he was made governor of Tennessee. When the Civil War broke out, he took sides with the North, though he was born in the South and lived there. And when Lincoln was made president, he took the next place as vice president. On Lincoln's death, he took the president's chair. The whole land was now upset. In the South, the white men had no work, and the slaves did not know how to care for themselves. In the North there was strife as to the terms on which the South should come back into the Union, and on many things Johnson and his Congress did not think the same. So there was strife between them. It came to its height in 1868, when the Senate tried Johnson for high crimes and misdemeanors. This means that Congress thought the President do not act for the good of the land, and should be put out of office. But the men who tried him did not all think the same, and most of them said he should keep his place. So he was in the chair for four years, and then went home to Elizabethtown, Tennessee, where he lived till his death on July twenty ninth, eighteen seventy five. End of chapter seventeen. Recording by Greg Giordano.
Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 18 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy. Chapter 18 Ulysses Simpson Grant. The boy who was to be first a great general in the army, and then President of the United States, was born at Point Pleasant, Ohio, April 27, 1822. As a boy he did not care for books, but was fond of sports and games, and had a great love for horses. He was but eight years old when he put a young colt to a sled, and hauled sticks and logs from the woods to his home, and he was but twelve when he made a trade of a horse he had for a young colt, which had not been used much. On his way home a dog sprang at the colt, which at once, mad with fear, tried to run away. The boy held fast to his reins, and stopped the colt just on the edge of a great cliff. But it was in such fear that it would not move, and the boy for a time knew not what to do. At last he took his handkerchief, tied it over the colt's eyes, and so drove him home. Folks near the Grant home said there was no horse which young Ulysses could not ride. He was a boy who had a firm will and strong nerves, and was at the head in all sports or games, for young boys soon learn which one of them must take the lead. He did not stand so high in school, but did his tasks well, and in 1839 he went to West Point. Here he soon had many friends, and they gave him a name which clung to him for life. He was called Uncle Sam, from the U.S. in his first two names. At West Point he read a great deal of war, and the men who had done brave deeds for their country, and when he left there he was at heart, as well as in name, a soldier of his country. He at once took his place with the troops, who were at war with the Indians in the West, but his first big fight was at Palo Alto, in 1846. At the close of this war, Grant, who had shown much skill and knew no fear, was sent to the West once more to force the Indians to keep peace. He was in California while the gold craze was at its height, to try and make the rough men who came in search of gold keep the laws of the land. Then, from 1854, he had a few years of peace, and started to tan hides and skins in Galena, Illinois. But his life was ever at his country's call, and he was one of the first men to take up arms in the Civil War. He was made a general soon after the war broke out, and one of his first acts was to block all the streams and roads near his post at Cairo, on the Ohio River, so that the South could get no food or arms. Grant was known as a brave fighter, and often was in the midst of the fight at the head of his men. At a great loss of life to his troops, he took two strong forts from the south, Forts Henry and Donelson, and then came that great fight at Shiloh, where the troops of the south were cut down, and the north won the day. Grant was now put next to the head of the whole army, and at once tried to take the city of Vicksburg. The siege of this city was hard for those in its walls, and for the troops in front of it, for Grant and his men could get no food from the north, and the city was quite cut off from help. The city made a brave stand for two long months, but had to give in at last, and at the end of that time Grant and his men marched into the city. Now this great general showed what a kind heart he had, for he gave food and clothes to the poor, men who had fought so long and so well to save their town. 
and he tried hard, at this time, to think of some way to bring the war to a close. Grant was not a hard man, but he was a just one, and in his camps the men must live the right sort of lives. He would not let his men steal food from the farms about them, or rob the poor folks in their homes. He was a plain man, and his dress showed his plain tastes. Once, when he had his troops march past him, that he might see how they looked, he wore such a plain garb that his captains were dressed better than he. He wore no sword, sash, nor belt, just a plain dark suit, with a soft felt hat on his head, and a pair of kid gloves on his hands. He was a great smoker, and, it is said, his big plans were all made when his cigar was in his mouth. In 1863, Grant won a great fight at Chattanooga, and in the fierce fight in the wilderness, he and General Lee met for the first time. Grant's next great work was to seize Petersburg, and so he laid siege to the town. He dug a huge mine in front of the doomed city, and filled it full of powder that would go off when fired with a match. When this great charge went off, the fort was blown to small bits, and heaps of dead and dying men lay in the midst of the ruin. But the brave men of the South still held the fort, and drove back the troops from the north as they rushed up. And so well did they fight, that Grant and his men had to draw back, and leave Petersburg alone for some time. The next time he tried to take the town, though, General Lee, who was in charge, was forced to yield, and soon the red, white, and blue waved over the southern city. Soon after this, Grant took from Lee all the troops in his charge, and it was now plain to see that the war must soon end. You read in the life of Lincoln of the terms of peace which Grant gave to the great chief of the South, and it seems that these two men, Grant and Lee, had no hard thoughts for each other, for when peace was made, they shook hands and parted friends. Each had done his best in the cause he thought right. Grant's trip to the North when the war was at an end was a grand one. Crowds rushed to see the man who had saved the Union, and cheers and shouts rang to the skies. He was, of course, named for President, and a great vote put him in office. He was in the President's seat for two terms, and was the only man since Washington who was thought of for a third term. But this the whole land said no to, as no man should be president longer than Washington had been. In Grant's last term, a big fair was held in Philadelphia, called the Centennial, to keep in mind this was the great day on which this land was made free. At the end of Grant's two terms, he took a tour of the world, and all lands made much of the soldier president. Rich gifts were placed in his hands, and at the courts of the old world, kings and queens were glad to have this plain, quiet man as a guest. His last home was in New York, and here, in 1884, he fell sick. He lost much money at this time, and was, in truth, a poor man. But he was, to the last, a brave man, and in the midst of much pain, he wrote the book of his life, that when he was dead his wife should have money from its sale. He died after eight long months of great pain, at Mount McGregor, near Saratoga, on July 23, 1885. His body lay in state in New York for some days, and crowds from far and near came to view this great man for the last time. He was laid to rest August 8, 1885, at Riverside Park, New York City, and the white marble tomb that marks this spot is a gift to the great dead from the land he served so well. End of chapter 18 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 19 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Greg Giordano. Lives of the Presidents, told in words of one syllable, by Jean S. Remy. Chapter Nineteen. Rutherford B. Hayes. Rutherford B. Hayes was born in Delaware, Ohio, October fourth, eighteen twenty-two. Such a strong, rosy little boy was he, that he had the pet name of Ruddy. His father had a big farm, and a store as well, so he was quite rich, and little Ruddy grew up in a bright and happy home. He came of a race of brave men, who had fought and died for this fair land, in the wars of the Revolution and of 1812, and he grew up as brave as they. He and his little sister Fanny went when young to a small school near their home, and the good wise mother helped them with their books at home. Rutherford worked hard at school, and went when quite young to the high school, where he soon stood at the head of his class. He was sixteen when he went to Kenyon College, Ohio. Now, though he was so good at his books, he loved sport and fun as well, and he was so strong that he could walk miles on the coldest of days, and yet get no hurt. Once he walked all the way from college to his home and back, when the snow lay deep on the ground, and this was forty miles. He could swim and skate, and knew how to fish and hunt. The boys at college all liked him. He had hosts of friends, and the strong, brave will that kept him at the head in games and sports put him first in his class, too. He left college in 1842, and took up the study of law at Harvard College in 1846. He was made one of the bar, and took up practice of law in Cincinnati. When the Civil War broke out, he, as captain of a band of men from his home, did brave good work. Once he was shot and fell to the ground, but he did not give up. He told his men what to do as he lay there in great pain, and kept up till someone came to take his place as leader. At the end of the war he was a general, and was much loved by his men. He was sent to Congress by his state, and then made its governor for three terms. In 1876 he was made president, though some thought by a fraud in the count. And the Democrats said that their man, Samuel J. Tilden, should have been president. While Hayes was at the White House, there was a great labor strike, from the east to the west, on all the railroads. The heads of the roads said that they would not pay the men, in their hire, as much as they had done, and so all the men left their work, and no trains could run, for the men came in great mobs to stop them. At last they rose in arms, and then the troops were sent out to force them to keep the peace. Nine men were killed and some of the rest were badly hurt. But the men did not give up for a long time. They held Pittsburgh for two days, and burned cars and the grain kept in them. Of course, in the end, the law had to be obeyed, and the mobs were made to come to terms and lay down their arms. There was a war with the Indians while Hayes was in the chair, but this was put down by General Howard, and after some fierce fights, the chiefs were caught and bound to keep the peace. There was a change made in the way of life at the White House while Hayes was there, for no wine was ever put on the table for guests, or for the President and his wife. This was the first time, and so far, the only time, that wine has not had its place at least at the state meals at the White House. Hayes was in Washington for one term, and then went to his home in Massillon, Ohio. He died on January 17th, 1893. End of chapter 19 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 20 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy. Chapter 20 James Abram Garfield. In rough log cabins, out of the midst of wild woods, we have read that six of our presidents were born. The seventh, James Abram Garfield, was born in Orange, Ohio, on November 19, 1831. His father had built, with his own hands, their small, rude home, and it stood deep in the wild wood, whose trees would, at times, catch fire from the sparks thrown from the steam engines some miles off. Near the Garfield home was their field of grain. One day this caught fire, and in trying to save his wheat, the father of little James lost his life. It was a hard life to which he left his young wife and the four little ones. But she was a brave good woman. She had to work hard, of course, and so did the boys. But the mother taught them from books as well and little James was but four years old when he went to his first school. He was a tough, strong boy, and soon did a large part of the farm work. In the long summers he had the most work to do, and then in the winters he could go to school. He was a brave boy, for the school was miles from home, and his road lay through the deep woods, in which wild beasts roamed at will. But he went his way, and if he felt fear, did not show it. He had a great love for books, and late at night, with the big wood fire for his light, he would read over and over his few books. His mother had taught him to love the Bible, and this good book he knew well. But at last the time came when he was so old that he could leave home, and so help the mother more than he had done. The first thing he did was to drive mules on the towpath of the Ohio Canal. Here he earned ten dollars a month, but the men he met were coarse and rough, and the life rude and vile. So, with a sad heart, the young boy, fresh from his good home in the quiet woods, took what he had made here and went back to the place he loved. He was sick for a long while now, and as he lay on his bed, he made up his mind that he would go to college and lead a good, useful life out in the big world that he would use his brains more than his hands. With this hope in front of him, he made money in the summer to pay his way at school in winter, and soon knew all that they could teach, and went to Hiram College. Here at first he did all sorts of work to pay his way, rang the bells, swept the floors, built the fires. But he was soon paid to teach in the college, for he was too bright and quick to do such hard work long. In 1854, he went to Williams College, and left at the head of his class in 1856. From now on he rose fast. He taught school when he left college. His boys loved the big strong man, and said so much in his praise, that men learned to love him too. And in 1859, he was made one of the Ohio Senate, and soon after sent to Congress. Then came the Civil War, in which he fought bravely. He won much fame in some of the great battles, and was made a general. He was a warm, close friend of Lincoln, and on the day of Lincoln's death, it was Garfield who spoke such calm, good words to a mob of men on Wall Street, New York, that he kept them from rash acts at this sad time. At the close of the war, Garfield was in Europe for a short time, and when he came home, he was sent to Congress, where he kept his seat for a long time. In 1880 he was named for president, and took his seat in 1881. But there was a great grief in store for this land once more. On July 2nd, 1881, just four months from the time he took his seat, Garfield was shot by Charles Gateau, as he, with James G. Blaine, was on his way to take a train north from Washington. They bore him back to the White House, and the man who had done this foul act was seized. The whole land prayed for Garfield's life, 
but he grew worse fast, and it was thought best at last to take him to Long Branch, where it was cooler than in Washington. But the long hot months dragged on, and the sick man did not grow well in the cool salt air, as it had been hoped. In spite of all care, the President failed day by day, and on September 19, 1881, the whole world heard with sorrow of this good man's death. The great men of the day wept side by side as Garfield lay in state in Washington, and men of note in all walks of life felt his death as a great grief. He now lies at rest in Cleveland, Ohio. Guiteau was hanged for the crime he had done, and it is but just to say that some thought he was not in his right mind when he shot Garfield. End of chapter 20 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 21 of Lives of the President Told in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz of Wellington, Kansas. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy. Chester Allen Arthur. Chester Allen Arthur was born in Fairfield, Vermont on October 5, 1830, and his father had charge of the church in that place and was one of the first men to speak for the poor slaves. Now, in those days, those good men did not live as well as they do now, for folks were poor in the small towns. So this small boy was also born in a log cabin, but he was sent to good schools and was quite young when he knew so much that he could go to Union College. All the time he was here, he paid his own way, and when he left college, he taught school, so that he could lay by means to go to New York and study law. He was soon in law practice, and he and an old schoolmate made the name of their firm well known. Arthur took the part of the black race, just as his father had done, and in 1856, he won a suit which let the Negroes ride in horse cars with the whites. A slave girl had been put off a car, and Arthur took up her case and won it. For some years, he held high office in the state of New York and was the general in the Civil War. He was not in the fights, but saw that the troops had clothes and food. He did this hard task so well that when the war was at an end, the president gave him the best place in New York State. He was made chief of the great port of New York and held this post for two terms. In 1880, he was made vice president with Garfield as president and, of course, took the chair when Garfield died. He held this place for one term and went back to his home in New York City and took up his law work. There was a split in his party at the end of his term. Some men wished Arthur to run once more for president, but more wished James G. Blaine of Maine, so, of course, Blaine was named. The Democrats named Grover Cleveland, and as all the men on that side wished this one man to win, he had the most votes, and for the first time in a long while, the Democrats won in the race for president. Two years from the time that Arthur came home, and right in the midst of his law work, he died in New York City. This was on November 18, 1886, and he was laid to rest in Albany. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy. Chapter 22. Stephen Grover Cleveland. The race of brave, strong men from whom Stephen Grover Cleveland sprang made their first homes here in Massachusetts as far back as 1635. His father had charge of a small church in Caldwell, New Jersey, and here, in a neat white frame house, which you may see for yourselves today, was born on March 18, 1837, the boy who was to rise step by step to the president's seat. He was three years old when they moved to Fayetteville, New York, and here he first went to school and lived till he was twelve years old. He showed a strong will and a great love for books as a small boy. He would have his own way if he could get it, and this was why he was sent to a high school when he was not so old by some years as the rest of the boys there. He gave his father no rest till he sent him, and once there he made up his mind to lead his class. He was just twelve when his strong will sent him to work in a store near his home, so that he could help care for the big family in the small home. The man who hired him soon saw that, if he was young, he knew how to work well, and that he could trust him. For two years he worked in the store, and then went back to his books. But just at this time his father died, and he then had to find a way to care for those in great need at home. With the same pluck that he had shown in the past, he now went to work in a home for the blind in New York. In this big city, the bright boy saw and heard much which gave him new thoughts, and put in his heart the wish to make his life a great one. At the end of two years in the home, he made up his mind to learn law, and he asked a man whom he knew to lend him $25 to start him. The fact that this man did so shows that he had trust in young Grover Cleveland, he could now start his work, and went to Buffalo to do so. Here he lived for eight years. At first he helped his uncle in the care of a big farm, and the money he so made was sent to his mother. Soon he had the chance to study law. The place where he went was two miles from his uncle's home, but back and forth, rain or shine, he walked each day. There is told a tale that shows how he loved the books of law, for, the first day he went to this place, a book was put in his hands to read. He kept at it for hours till dark came, then he found the rest of the men had gone home, all the doors were locked, and he must stay there all night. Such hard work soon made him a man who well knew the law, and folks gave him big cases that brought him much fame. He did not go to the war when it broke out, for he felt that he could not leave his folks at home with no one to care for them. He rose fast in his law work, and more than one great case did he win. He cared far more to take the part of the poor than of the rich, and at no time in his life did he look for high place or fame. It came to him, though, for he was just the man to fill a high post well. His name was soon known in his state and at Washington. For three years he was sheriff of Erie County, and then he took up his law practice once more. But soon he was put at the head of his city as its mayor, and then was made the governor of the great state of New York. Here he did good work, he put down those who had taken bribes and had not been good, true men, and he tried to see that the laws were well kept. Men saw that he was the right man to fill this high place, for he had no fear of what might be thought of him. He just did as he felt right, and so, while he was still governor, he was named for president by a great vote and was elected. When he took the oath of office in Washington, he did not kiss the big Bible which other presidents had kissed, but a little old book much worn with use, which his mother had given to him when he first left home. He was in the chair four years, and while here, he took for his wife Miss Frances Folsom. He was the first president to wed in the White House. Cleveland was president for four years. At the end of that time, the Republicans placed Benjamin Harrison in the president's chair. But at the end of one term, once more the Democrats won the day, and again in 1893 we see Grover Cleveland president. By May of 1894, the World's Fair was opened, and few boys and girls are too young to know something of the beauty of the great white city built on the shores of Lake Michigan in Chicago. In the last years of Cleveland's term, there was much talk of the state of things in Cuba. The men there wished to be free from Spain, who had ruled them with a hard hand for hundreds of years. Spain sent down troops of soldiers, and harsh laws were made to force the Cubans to keep the peace. But Cuba would not give up and the United States began to feel pity for this brave little island trying to get free. In the midst of the strife, Cleveland's term of office came to an end, and he came to New York to live and take up law again. He now has his home in Princeton, New Jersey, and has a large law practice. 
End of chapter 22. Chapter 23 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy. Chapter 23 Benjamin Harrison. In the first part of this book, you heard of a brave Indian fighter whose name was William Henry Harrison, and you saw this brave man mount step by step to the president's chair. It is his grandson, Benjamin Harrison, whom we now see president of the United States. He was born in his grandfather's home at North Bend, Indiana, on August 20th, 1833. There were no good schools near his home, so in a small log house at his grandfather's grounds, he first went to school. He and a few other boys and girls were taught here by those whom the Harrisons hired. In this school the seats were of planks, laid on sticks that were stuck in holes in the floor. They had no backs, and were so high that the small boys and girls could not touch their feet to the floor. Only in the winter did this small boy go to school. In the summer he had work to do on the big farm. He did his work well, but he also learned to shoot, to fish, to swim, and to ride. He was much liked by all the boys, for he was full of sports and jokes. In 1820 he went to Miami College, and left in 1822 to study law. In one of his first cases, the light was so dim that he could not see the notes he had made with such care. What should he do? There was but one thing he could do. Fling to one side the notes and plead his case without any. This was a hard thing to do, but he did it so well that he won his case, and the great men of the day gave him much praise for his speech. When the Civil War broke out, he raised a troop of men from his own state and was made the colonel of this band, which was called the 70th Indiana. He served for two years and won fame in some of the great battles of the war. So brave was he at Resaca that he was made a brigadier general. Throughout the long years of war, he was kind and good to the men in his care. They loved him well and gave him the name of Little Ben. Not till the war was at an end did he leave the field. Then, with much fame, he went back home and took up his work at law. He took a high place in his own state and made some great speeches. It was now the year 1889. Just one hundred years had passed since Washington, our first president, took his place as president of the United States, and the whole land thought it right to celebrate the date. So in New York City, on April 29th and 30th, was held the Washington Centennial. The city was hung from end to end with red, white, and blue, the grand good face of Washington, framed in the flag of the land, or wreathed in green, looked down on the gay scene. Rank by rank, the troops filed by amidst the shouts and cheers of the dense crowds that filled the streets, and looked from the windows of stores and houses. Rich and poor, great and small, kept this great day. The President and other great men from Washington were brought to the foot of Wall Street, on a barge hung with flags. Here all the ships of war were drawn up on each side, and as the party went to the spot where Washington took his oath of office, young girls clad in white cast flowers before them. As the troops filed past the president, one saw not just those from the north, but up from the south came hosts of men bearing the flags of their states, all glad to share in this great day of the nation. And there were men from across the seas, too. The Germans and the French marched side by side with the Americans. By night, fireworks and bonfires filled the streets with light, and blazed in beauty. No such great time had ever been known in this land, and this was as it should be, for it was all done for the great good man who had led our troops so well in our first war that he had made us free, and had then, by a wise and just rule, helped us to be the great, strong land that we are today. While Harrison was in office, Work was begun for the World's Fair, which was held in Chicago in 1892, just 400 years since Columbus first saw America. Harrison went to Chicago and opened the fair with a speech on October 14, 1892, but folks could not go there till the next year. In 1893, Harrison went home to Indiana and took up his law work once more. He is still alive, is well known as a good lawyer, and has many warm friends among the great men of our day. We have seen that Grover Cleveland now became president. At the end of his four years, the Republicans put William McKinley in office. End of chapter 23、Chapter、24 of Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Smith. Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy. Chapter 24 William McKinley. The man who now, in the year 1900, stands at the head of our great land, was born at Niles, Ohio, on January 29, 1843. In the schools near his home, he was taught his letters, and, as a child, was fond of books and quick to learn. He was a mere boy when he taught school to earn the means to go to college. The schoolhouse in which he taught still stands. It is a plain, square, white house with two windows in front and three on each side. His mother was a good woman, with a clear, strong brain. She taught him, as well as his eight brothers and sisters, to love truth and to live brave and strong lives. Young William was not long to lead a life of peace, for in 1861 he then but a boy of eighteen, left his books and his home and went to the war. Many stories prove how brave he was while there, but two will show you why he rose so fast from the ranks. At one time the guns had been left on the road after a great fight, and it would be a hard task to go back near the foe to get them. But... Young McKinley said, The boys will hold them. And he and a few others went back for them and brought them into our lines. Then he was at one time two miles from the fight, in charge of the food, and he was quite safe. But he thought our men would fight better if they had some coffee and food. So he filled a cart and drove straight to the lines, where our brave men were hard at work. Was this not a brave act, to risk his life for the sake of taking food and drink to the worn men? He worked his way straight to the front, and came out of the war a captain. He went home at once and took up the study of law in Canton. One of his first speeches was for the rights of the black man. He said that they should have the same right to vote that white men had, and he was ever on the side of the black man. In 1869, McKinley was married to Miss Ida Saxton. They were both very young when their two little children died. The young lawyer did all he could to cheer his wife and she was as brave as he, and did not let her grief keep him from his work. He rose fast in his state, and held high place more than once. Then, in 1877, he was sent to Congress. In 1891, he was made governor of Ohio, and in 1897, he had made such a great name for himself that he was put up for president by the Republicans and elected. Just as he came into office, the strife in Cuba was at its height, and the men here in our great free land had much pity for the Cubans who were trying to get free from Spain. Just as we had tried to shake off the hand of England long years ago, the Spanish rule grew worse and worse, as Spain found that Cuba would not give in. At last, General Whaler, a harsh and cruel man, was sent there to force peace 
on any terms. But General Gomez knew his foes well, and his brave men fought with a strength born of a great hate for Spain. By and by, when Spain saw she could not win the day, she sent word that if Cuba would lay down her arms, she could have the rights for which she had asked in vain in the past. But it was too late. Cuba had no faith in Spain, and would now be free from her hard yoke. There was much want in the big towns of Cuba at this time. For Whaler had made all the poor folks who had lived in peace on their small farms come into the towns. He said they gave help to the Cuban troops, and so he forced them to leave their homes and would only let them bring with them just a few things that they could put on their backs. Then he had their little homes and their crops, which they had raised with care all burned to the ground. He had little food to give this great host of poor people, and many died in the streets for the want of bread. You may be sure that our great land saw the pain and want down in Cuba, and longed to give aid. But an act of help on our part would mean war with Spain, and this McKinley did not wish. But there came a day when a great cry went up through the United States at a foul deed done in the Bay of Havana. Our great warship, the Maine, was blown up by a bomb as she lay at anchor in the harbor. The thought of our poor men sent to such a death raised the cry of war in all hearts. Remember the main was the war cry, and men cried for war at once with Spain. But McKinley gave Spain one more chance to stop the fight and free Cuba. This she would not do. So on April 21st, 1898, once more, the United States had to make ready for war. From all the states, men poured in, and camps sprang up here and there, where the men were taught to load and fire their guns. Off at Hong Kong, in charge of our warships, was brave Admiral Dewey. He knew that the Spanish fleet was in Manila Bay, near the Philip Pine Islands, which were ruled by Spain. The loss of these ships would be a great blow to Spain just at this time. So Dewey steered his ships there to strike a blow for his country. It was night when he reached the spot, and before the Spaniards knew he was near, six of his great ships had slipped past their forts. Then a fierce fire poured on him from the forts, but it did not do much harm. At last the Spanish fleet saw him, and at once the ships opened fire. But Dewey's flagship, the Olympia, sent out such a storm of shot and shell that the first of the Spanish ships was sunk, and all on board killed. The fight lasted two hours, and at the end of that time the Spanish fleet had all been sunk. Great joy was felt in the United States when this glad news was heard, and Dewey was the hero of the whole land. Our men down in Cuba fought well, and many brave deeds were done. On June 6th, Admiral Sampson fired on the forts at Santiago. Our men put their hearts in their work, and their aim with their great guns was true and straight. The Spaniards did not aim so well, and their shots did not go so far, and so the shot and shell from their forts 
did not do us much harm soon our men had stopped the fire from all the forts save castle moro and this fort was rent and torn in great holes on june twenty fourth our rough riders with the theodore roosevelt at their head were sent out to clear the way to santiago the foe poured a hot fire on our men from the tall grass and weeds in which they lay hidden and there was great loss of life full of fire and pluck were these rough riders and led by their brave colonels roosevelt and wood they forced the spanish troops back foot by foot the line of fight was five miles long the heat was fierce and food and water scarce but at last the troops came to the fort of san juan hill then with a mad rush up up went our men to the spanish fort at the head cheers and shouts rose to the skies as the red white and blue waved from the old spanish fort but the cost of this fort had been great for there was much loss of life on both sides on july third serva the spanish admiral tried to sail his fleet out of the bay of santiago he was seen though by our men and after a hot chase and fierce fighting the whole spanish fleet was burned or sunk spain lost scores of brave men but on our side not one man was killed nor did we lose a ship the end of the war was near on july tenth we laid siege to santiago and on july seventeenth we went into the city and raised over it the stars and stripes in this part of the world the last shot had been fired but dewey in the far east did not know this and so he struck one more blow for his country he took the city of manila with the loss of but twelve men and when our flag waved over this city the end of the spanish war had come on january first eighteen ninety nine the spanish flag which for four hundred years had waved over cuba was hauled down the red white and blue of our own land took its place and cuba free from the hard rule of spain blessed the great nation that had come to her aid in september of eighteen ninety nine admiral dewey came home and from end to end of this land his name was cheered he was the guest of the city of new york for three days and well did the city honor the hero of manila when we took manila from spain and so closed the spanish war it did not give us the philippines the men there were glad to have us drive out the spaniards but did not wish us to take their place long months of war followed but now aguinaldo their chief has yielded and peace seems to be at hand it was not easy to see when mckinley became president that we were soon to be in the midst of war but our land has borne her part well we have gained new lands in the far east and our flag waves over strange people who have not yet learned that it stands for freedom they still fear that the yoke of the united states will be as hard to bear as that of spain this is not so and it will not be long before all these far-off lands will learn to love and bless the red white and the blue just as every state in our great union does today end of chapter 24 recording by john smith the end end of lives of the presidents told in words of one syllable by jean s remy